Tell me something about CMBS and your role in that. I created it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so t- tell me about that, because that's, uh, that's very interesting. Well, I didn't invent CMBS, right? So CMBS, which is the securitization and pooling or selling of loans, securities backed by commercial real estate loans, I would credit the first deals done to uh, Solomon Brothers and Lou Ranieri and Steve Roth, who later left and went to Drexel and was a colleague of mine and a good friend. And I'm friends with Lou to this day. And they really created the first CMBS model. They did a single asset deal backed by an office building in lower Manhattan in the late 80s. They tried to roll the business out to become a bigger business, but it was the wrong, it was the right idea at the wrong time. And of course, there's an important lesson to be learned there is that success comes with not just smart ideas and not just smart people willing to work very hard, but there's the magic formula that we don't control, which is timing. So Steve and Lou had a great idea. They clearly had the right firm. They clearly had the work ethic, but they were competing against a wall of really mispriced capital from all sorts of uh, institutional lenders, insurance companies, banks, foreign banks, who were just pouring money into the U.S. real estate market really without regard to price. I I remember seeing in the late 80s uh, 10-year first mortgages priced at basically the same yield as 10 year treasuries, which obviously makes no sense. Like, well, how could that be? And you, of course you realize that we were living at a time because real estate was untethered to the capital markets, that that happened because there was an absence of relative value analysis because of that untethering. So for those people who can't imagine something like that occurring, because the world has changed thanks to people like myself who brought the real estate market into the capital markets. Um, But back then, real estate lenders, insurance companies, primarily banks, foreign banks, they would get us, the division that was in charge of lending would get a certain allocation of funds from the company. And they would be told, put this money out this year. Literally, those would be the words that were, would be used. And as though the money was like a hot potato that needed to be gotten rid of quickly. And believe me, it was gotten rid of quickly. Because if you think about the incentive for the lender who's being told, here's a billion dollars, get rid of it in January, right? Well, the goal is get rid of it before golf season starts in May. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and invariably there would be um, incredible price arbitrage if you loaned in the second half of the year versus the first half of the year. Because in the first half of the year, everyone wanted to get the money out the door so they can golf all summer, right? This was the quaint world of finance that I grew up in that doesn't exist anymore. And the head of lending at these companies wouldn't really be comparing, there was no benchmarking, like, gee, is this a good yield versus corporate bonds or government bonds? This is just like, let's just get the money out the door, right? And make sure we're making decent loans, right? So I'm not kind of poo-pooing credit quality, although, of course, in every cycle, there's credit quality mistakes, and there were then too. But I think that what was the biggest kind of like systemic error was the absence of relative value benchmarking and the rush to put the money out the door. 